job to say to Kamala Harris, our nominee for vice president, welcome to our city today. Yeah. Welcome to the 15th largest city in the country. Thank you for being here. Thank you for what she's going to do, what she's going to do tonight to talk to us and explain to her, uh, to all of us, why she deserves this opportunity to serve us. But before we start talking a little bit more about that, I want to be serious about a little bit of history here. In 2016, the turnout in Charlotte was 67% in the presidential election. Now, you know the surrounding counties, and you know who surrounds us, they exceeded 70% of the turnout. So when you think about what you can do, the 15th largest city with a 67% turnout in 2016, hey, it's time to step it up. 70%, 80%, 90%. But only you can make that happen. It's our responsibility. If you care, you heard the Congresswoman, if you care about health care, if you care about education, and we all care about affordable housing, don't we? Charlotte, we know what it means. These towers didn't get here without the people that their essential workers made it possible. Those are the reasons that we have these towers the people that paved the way for our future. And you know what they did? They voted because they know that voting was their power. They know that people died for the opportunity for them to vote. And if all, each of us thinks about that today in a serious way, had that serious conversation with yourself, we all know that we can do better than 67%. We can do better than 70%. We can do better than 80% because we have to turn this country around. You know, when you have someone that can't say something about white supremacy, if you have someone that can't understand how women are the backbone of this country and treats them with respect, if you can't find someone that's actually going to care about not just the color of your skin, but who you are as a person, then I don't want you to go to the polls. But if you care deeply about what change can mean for this country, we need to get out and vote. The Biden-Harris ticket, the Biden-Harris ticket commits us to the country that I want to be and see for the next generation. You know, I grew up in a place where white and black people didn't really mix around until I got to high school. I remember being in high school. I remember my prom, prom most important thing to a young 17-year-old woman, right? They had the prom in a segregated country club, and I didn't get to go to prom. So think about that. That's not that long ago. Think about the bias that we have in this country and the president that brought that bias to the forefront and is trying to make it possible for it to continue. We got to stop this. We have got to stop this. So what I say to you is we can welcome Senator Harris and she's gonna to talk to us about what change means when we support her. But more importantly, if we don't commit individually, collectively, to get out the vote, up the ticket, down the ballot, all the way through, for people that are gonna change this country, bring out the best in us, make it possible for the next generation, the next generation, to have someone in the White House that they can respect and honor, that we don't have to turn off the TV when the president comes on. Joe Biden is that person. He has empathy. He understands the common person. They understand the trials and tribulations, as they say in church, of what we're going through. And we need that. We need that reminder that you can put the past behind you, the future in front of us, and the future 
is Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. The future is change in this country that allows the next generation to be successful because they have lived through the opportunity to deal with restorative justice that Senator Harris had in California and she can bring to D.C. We can have a future that's different because Senator Harris can be a spokesperson for young black and brown girls everywhere in this world. We can have a future that is inclusive and welcoming and diverse and moves us forward. So welcome to Char for, to, from Charlotte to Senator Harris. But more importantly, let's make Charlotte the city that takes her to the White House. Thank you all very much. Please welcome to the stage head coach of Duke University women's basketball, Kara Lawson. <laughs> Hey everybody, how you doing? Good, I love being in North Carolina. I'm new to North Carolina, but I love being in North Carolina because it's a basketball state. It's a hoop state. And if you'll forgive me a little bit, most of my analogies revolve around the sport of basketball because it's where I spent my whole life. I played 13 years in the WNBA. I represented, thank you. I represented this great country in the Olympics and, and won a gold medal. And I get asked all the time what I miss the most about playing. I get asked that all the time. Coach, now I'm a coach. Coach, what do you miss the most about playing? And it's an easy decision, or it's an easy answer, I should say. I miss the competition. You miss the competition. But not just the blanket statement of competition. What I really miss is the biggest moments of competition, like the biggest games the highest stakes, how you feel in the locker room before the big games, how you feel on the court before those pressure moments. I miss those a lot. And the reason I miss them is because they are revealing. They're revealing. You can't hide from them and you can't hide what comes out of you in those moments. You can't do it. And when I look at what helps people succeed in those moments, the base layer of that is confidence, right? You gotta be confident in those moments. You gotta have that. That's not the only thing, but you, you do have to have that. The other thing you have to have is courage. You gotta have courage. You gotta understand that when the stakes are high, you're gonna have to do something courageous. You're gonna have to make a play. You're going to have to be unafraid of the fact that losing is a possible outcome, right? Everyone has courage when winning is the outcome that they know is gonna happen. But it takes courage to be able to get into a fight when you know that losing is possible. Losing's possible. So you gotta have courage. You gotta have focus in those pressurized moments, a mind that's absent of distraction, right? You gotta be able to focus in in those pressurized moments and you gotta be able to execute. And the last thing you gotta have is respect. Respect's really important as an athlete because a level of respect that you have for an opponent, for a teammate, for a person is always equal to the level of preparation that you put in. Think about that. If you have a low level of respect for somebody, then the amount of preparation that you put in to beat that person is gonna be low. You got a high level of respect for somebody, you're gonna have a higher level of preparation to put in to try and beat them. So respect's really important, it's really important. So I've heard this a lot during, during the election, during the campaign, about the stakes. Everyone's talk about it, right? Everyone talks about the stakes, they're high. And it brings me back to what succeeds on the court in those situations. Confidence, courage, focus, respect. Confidence, courage, focus, and respect. The preparation you put in leads to that respect. You can't come up in a big game and in high stakes and just wing it. 
It's not how it works. You can't wing it, right? You have to be able to have a high level of preparation. So when I look at Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, those four things ooze out of them, man. They ooze out of them. Confidence, right? Really confident. Confident in who they are, confident in what they can achieve. Courage. Think it's easy to be in this type of campaign? You think it's easy to battle the type of opponent they're battling? It's not easy. It takes courage to do that. It takes a great focus. Focus on who you're helping. Focus on why you're doing it. And focusing on when you get there, everything that it's going to take to get done. And then respect. Respect. It's, it's not just your team, it's your opponent, and it's also yourself. And that to me is a defining characteristic as to why Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are the best people to take that next step. Because when you look at respect, it's about respecting yourself first, right? My parents taught me this. I hope your parents taught you this. Respect yourself first. You respect yourself enough that you're going to do things the right way. You respect your team enough. We're the team. In this analogy, we're the team. You respect the team enough that you're going to do things the right way and you're going to do what's in the best interest of the team. Because here's the thing about leadership. You never lead in isolation. There's not a leader out there that does it by themselves. They need the team. They need the team. We're the team. We're the team. So they respect us enough. We're the team. The star players can't do it by themselves. The group has to be able to pull them through. So that's the challenge for all of us. It's my challenge, it's your challenge, it's everybody's challenge outside of the leaders, which are Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Our challenge is to be a part of their team to help them get where they need to go. They have everything inside them already. They have it. They have the confidence, they have the courage, they have the focus, they have the respect. Now it's about the team helping them get through in that situation. Thanks so much for having me here tonight. Please welcome to the stage, Reverend Robert W. Lee. Hey y'all, I know I've gotta get off soon because you gotta see someone else, but I, I wanted to say something really quick. I'm the descendant of Confederate General Robert E. Lee, and I wanna say something tonight, emphatically and unequivocally, that white supremacy is wrong. It is evil, it is going to hell. Now, if a, if a descendant of Robert E. Lee can say that, why can't our president say that? If I can say that, and my name's Robert Lee, why can't our president, who is just a few miles from here, offer the same rebuttal to the evil that we face in this country? Now, you may say that's not my battle. That's not my, that's not my problem. It's all of our problem. We are facing one of the most consequential elections of our lifetime. And look, I'm a pastor too. I'm not just a descendant of Confederate General Lee. I have to do something during the day. And one of the things I do is we talk about this. If you love someone, tell them about it. I'm gonna change that a little bit. I wanna say something today. If you love someone, tell them to vote. If you love someone who is marginalized, get them to the polls. If you love someone who feels left out by this current president, tell them to vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Because now is our time to shine, y'all. We got 13 days to the election. You can go vote right now. And if you're gonna love someone, if you're going to show this love that is so beautiful and so good, vote. Vote like our lives depend on it. Vote like your friends' lives depend on it. Because they do. So friends, it's, it's, it's my, my duty uh, to endorse as a, as a descendant of Confederate General Lee Kamala Harris, but it's also my privilege to introduce the next Vice President of the United States of America, Senator Kamala Harris. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the next Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Yes.
Reverend Lee, where'd you go? Thank you, Reverend Lee. I agree. If you love, there you are. If you love somebody, tell them to vote. <laughs> and I love you, so please vote. <laughs> oh, it's so good to be here, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Lyles. Thank you. It was so good to see your granddaughter, too. Thank you. There she is right there. It's all about our babies. And Alma Adams, my goodness. Just, you are a sister, a friend, a mentor. You encourage me every step of the way, and you are always there for me. Thank you, North Carolina, for the, the leaders that you have elected, the leaders that you bring to speak not only about the concerns and the needs of the great state of North Carolina, but they are national leaders. So I want to thank you for that. It's so good to be with you. We have 13 days to go. <laughs> a minute to spare not a minute to spare and there is so much at stake there's so much at stake you know um, here's the thing the reason that we are all here together right now is because we love our country we love our country imperfect though it may be flawed though it may be we love our country, and we know that this country we love and its democracy that we hold so dear, yes, it has taken a little bit of a beating with you-know-who, but what we know is our democracy and the strength of it will always be a function of our preparedness and willingness to fight for it. That's what makes our democracy strong. It's not a building. It's not someone. It is us, the people. We, the people. When we stand up, when we come out and say we are going to fight because we love our country and we will fight for the soul of our country like Joe Biden says, then we know we are strong and we know we will win. And there's so much at stake. You know, look, we, Joe and I talk about it, you all have heard. We're, you're living it. We're in the middle of four, at least four crises right now, right? We're in the middle of a crisis caused by this pandemic that is a public health crisis. Um, we're looking at over 220 million Americans who just in the last several months died. You know, many, it, it breaks, it breaks your heart. Many people who, who without their loved ones because of the nature of the virus, without somebody to be there with them in the hospital and hold their hand, in their last days on earth were by themselves. We're looking at over eight million people in our country who've contracted the virus with untold long-term impact. We're looking at over 30 million people that because of the economic impact of this virus have had to file for unemployment. People are talking about this recession and comparing it to the Great Depression. That's how bad it is. People are standing in food lines, driving up and parked in food lines, praying they can get to the end of the line before the food runs out. One in five mothers is describing her children in America as being hungry. One in seven renters in North Carolina described not being able to pay their rent last month. Meanwhile, meanwhile, thanks to Bob Woodward, we know Donald Trump was informed of the nature of this back on January 28th. Can you imagine if you had known on January 28th what you knew today? Can you imagine how you as a parent or a small business owner might have been able to prepare yourself, your family, the people who rely on you? He knew that it was airborne, knew that it would kill five times as likely as the flu, knew it would impact children, and he sat on that information. He did not tell the American people. He covered it up. He called it a hoax. He suggested that if you wear a mask, he knew it was airborne. 
If you wear a mask, well, in Donald Trump's mind, there's, two, there's a ledger, and you're on one side of the ledger, his side of the ledger. If you don't wear a mask, you're on another side of the ledger, if you do. And remember, the President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief of the United States, who is supposed to have as his first priority the health and well-being of the American people. And that's why he's got to go. We're looking at these four crises taking place at once. We're looking at the public health crisis, the economic crisis, the long overdue national reckoning on racial injustice. By the way, Let's not forget on the topic of you-know-who that he stood on that debate stage, last debate, with the great Joe Biden and refused to condemn white supremacists. Said, stand back and stand by. People have been asking me, journalists, well, you know, do you think he's a racist? Yes. Yes, I do. And there's a pattern here. Because I don't say that lightly. One should never say that lightly. But there's a pattern here. Think back to Charlottesville, where people were peacefully protesting on the issue of racial injustice. A young woman was killed. And on the other side, you had a group of neo-Nazis that were carrying tiki torches and shouting racial epithets, anti-Semitic slurs, wearing swastikas. And the president of the United States of America said, find people on both sides. Call Mexican, Mexican people rapists and criminals. A Muslim ban is one of his first acts when he got in office. We're dealing with so many crises. We're dealing with the climate crisis. You know, I did an event earlier, so I'm, I'm here in North Carolina, but in between I'm also doing virtual events. So just a minute ago, um, I guess I'm here, but in a minute ago I was in the state of Washington and Oregon, <laughs> California, <laughs> doing an event with folks, letting them know, by the way, that I was here with you. Um, the climate crisis where up and down the west coast of the United States, neighborhoods are on fire with these wildfires. You look at the coastal states, battered by the storms. Look in the Midwest, farmers have lost entire seasons of crops because of the floods. And when Donald Trump was asked, when he was asked, so, you know, about the wildfires, you know, scientists are saying, saying this and that about the connection with the climate crisis and these fires. You know what the President of the United States said? Science doesn't know. <laughs> Brother, what was he talking about? <laughs> Science doesn't know. The President of the United States on an issue that represents an existential threat to who we are as a species. We are in the midst of so much that demands true and real leadership. And that's why we're about to elect Joe Biden President of the United States. That's what we're gonna do, and we're gonna do it together. And we've got 13 days to get this done. We've got 13 days to stand up and speak loudly about who we really are as Americans and as a country. We are gonna stand with Joe Biden because you see, Joe knows that when we're talking, for example, about the economy, you know, if you ask Donald Trump, how's the economy doing? He'll say, great, right? Then you ask, well, how so would you measure the greatness of this so-called economy of, of yours? And he'll talk about the stock market. They'll talk about how rich people are doing. 
That's why they passed that tax bill benefiting the top 1% and the biggest corporations in America. You ask Joe Biden, how's the economy doing? And Joe Biden will say, well, let's talk about how American working people are doing, how are American families doing. That's how Joe Biden measures the success of the economy, which is why, as a first order of business, we will get rid of that tax cut benefiting the top 1% and the biggest corporations in America. Which is why we will not increase taxes on anyone making less than $400,000 a year. Which is why we will say that working families should not pay more than 7% of your income in child care. Which is why we will say we know that home ownership is one of the greatest ways that any family can grow their wealth and intergenerational wealth. And so there will be a $15,000 tax credit for new home buyers to help you with that down payment and closing costs. That's what a Biden-Harris administration will do when we talk about what we need to do to address this economy. Let's talk about health care, shall we? Let's talk. We're in the midst of a public health crisis. An old boy is in court with his boy Bill Barr trying to sue to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. Because you see, from the time he was running, and even before when he denied the legitimacy of America's first black president, he has been weirdly obsessed with trying to get rid of whatever Barack Obama and Joe Biden created. It's a weird obsession. We don't need presidents with weird obsessions. And so he's in court right now trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act that President Obama and Vice President Biden pushed through that brought health care to over 20 million people that didn't have it. The Affordable Care Act that said it's not right to deny people with pre-existing conditions like diabetes, like high blood pressure, like breast cancer. It's not right to deny them coverage because they have a pre-existing condition. So the Affordable Care Act said insurance companies can't do that any longer. And the people wanted it. But remember history, recent history. So Trump came in office, and they tried and tried to get rid of it. And they tried to get rid of it through Congress. And I was a member of the Senate. I had joined the Senate around that time, and I will never forget that early morning hour on the Senate well, it must have been like one or two o'clock in the morning, and they tried to get rid of it in Congress. They said repeal and replace. There was no replacement plan. But the American people have been coming, walking the halls of Congress from everywhere, from North Carolina, from everywhere, saying don't mess with our health care. And then at around two o'clock in the morning, the late, great John McCain said, no, you don't. No, you don't. So they tried to do it in Congress. They failed because the people spoke. Now they're trying to do it in the courts. On the other hand, you have Joe Biden, who is saying, let's build on the success of the Affordable Care Act. We're going to expand health coverage. We're going to bring down Medicare eligibility to age 60. We're going to bring down the cost of prescription drugs. We're going to lower premiums. We're going to expand health coverage, understanding that when we're talking about health care, we got to stop only thinking about the body as though it starts from the neck down when we also need to deal with health care from the neck up. <laughs> Mental health care and invest in that. So there's so many clear choices on some of the biggest issues we are facing. And that brings me then to what we've got in front of us for these next 13 days. We have got to make sure, like Reverend Lee said, everybody has to vote. If you love, if you love somebody, make sure they vote. <laughs> make sure they vote early. Because let's not forget, and I talk about North Carolina all the time, 
how this and so many of the states tried to get in the way of people's vote. Let us not forget how legislatures across this country, since they, through the Supreme Court, gutted the Voting Rights Act in 2013, set in place laws that, like the Court of Appeal here in North Carolina said, was written with surgical precision to try and get in the way of black folks voting, right? Let's not forget what's going on around our country. Let's not forget that the President of the United States at that last debate stood on a stage in front of 70 million Americans and openly encouraged the suppression of the vote. Let's not forget that. And let's ask why. Why are all these powerful people around the country passing these laws to try and confuse us, to try and get rid of drop boxes for people to drop off ballots, trying to make people have to fill out two different envelopes and have somebody else sign it, trying to mess with the post office, the post office, the post office. <laughs> Why, right baby, the post office. <laughs> and we have to ask, why are they doing this? And I'll tell you why, and we know why. Because they know our power when we vote. They know our power when we vote. When we vote, things change. When we vote, we win. So let us not let anybody ever take our power from us. We know our power. And so my final point is this. This moment will pass. It will pass. And years from now, our children, our grandchildren, and others, they will look at us, each one of us, they're going to look in our eyes, each one of us, and they will ask us, where were you at that moment? And what we're going to be able to talk about is so much more than just how we felt. We are going to tell them what we did. We are going to tell them we were hanging out in this beautiful field. We're going to tell them we were just hanging out together on this beautiful night in Charlotte. We're going to tell them about how we organized folks. We're going to tell them about how we voted early. We're going to tell them about how we talked to our neighbors and our friends and our coworkers about what's at stake. We are going to tell them that we stood up and we fought for our country because we love our country and we are better than this. We will tell them we elected Joe Biden president of the United States. Thank you. Get your own waist right on and keep it going, girl, girl.